All right, let's get started. Um, all right, let's, I, I sent you some questions, just so I'm gonna look through them now. Um, maybe we start with high level, um, just to get everybody on the same page. Um, how do you define privacy? Like privacy from whom and, you know, cause you, you could define that in a lot of different ways. Oh, that's how a good question. How do you think question. about it? Um, I think the, the thing that always, I always comes to my mind is that privacy equals consent. It's just, and I think that helps me think about it more clearly because there's a lot of confusion about the difference between like hiding everything, like being a spy or living in a cabin in the woods or whatever. Um, and that's not what almost anyone wants. But everybody wants control and like to, ha to consent to how their information is used today, right? Um. Well, I'm biased, I tend to think so. But do you, do you define that from like a um, privacy, you know, consent to whom? Like who is the object of, of, you know, who do you need privacy from and how do you think about that? Is it, you know, your neighbors? Is it the government? Is it like, you know, bad, like how do you, where, where do you draw that line on that spectrum of who you need privacy from and how do you think about That's that? That's another good question. You're, you're asking me lots of uh, unanswerable questions. Um, <laughs> a lot of people in this space and the cypherpunks that I came from tend to think of privacy from their government, from, the, from your government. Yeah. And I think that's really narrow. Most people don't care about that. And well, maybe half, I don't know. A, a lot of people don't care about getting privacy from their government. But everybody cares about privacy from their neighbors, yeah. right? Um, and most people care about privacy from foreign governments that are trying to like, yeah. influence your elections or whatever. Yeah. So I think both, I, I, I think the, you know, only like two or three years ago, we were in this era where, where people just said, oh, privacy is dead, get over it. it like the next generation doesn't care about that or whatever. Um, and now I think just the last couple of years, that's really changed and people think there is something really important here, the current, system is not sustainable or working. Yeah. So I think people really care, and I think that's partly because they now perceive that there's a much broader group or set of like adversaries who would like to exploit your information yeah. for their own uses. And so bringing it to crypto, do you think, um, you know, some people think privacy is just a feature. Do you think it's actually like the defining characteristic of a, of a cryptocurrency? Can it actually be the core central thing that people think about with crypto, or does it just become yet another feature in, in you know, a blockchain well, or a cryptocurrency? Wait, so you're asking, can we upgrade Bitcoin to have privacy? Yeah, in some sense. I mean, this also, I guess, gets at this idea of, uh, that's one way to put it, yeah. Maybe we'll stop there, and then I have kind of a follow-on. Well, the other thing you said is, is it defining? And that makes me, that when you ask that, I respond, yes, it is defining because privacy is <clears throat> really this necessary for decentralization. Like the whole reason that Bitcoin is better than like PayPal is that it's got censorship resistance yeah. and decentralization. And in my opinion, you have to have privacy for that to stick. And so do you, what do you think about privacy in Bitcoin relative to, to say Zcash? Like how do you think that is actually gonna play out? Um, is there, do you think there's a point at which Bitcoin becomes private enough? No, it's getting less private over time, right? Um, Satoshi and Hal and the others uh, in the early days tried to add privacy into Bitcoin and they couldn't because we didn't have good enough cryptography yet in like 2009. Yeah. So they knew it was desirable and Satoshi said, well, maybe this like workaround of using a different address every day or whatever, every transaction will help, but it doesn't. It's not, it's, it's, it reminds me of when the internet was new in the 1990s and people said on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog because a TCP IP address is just four numbers with dots between them. It doesn't yeah. have your name in it. Uh, that's like the level of naivete of thinking that Bitcoin has privacy because a Bitcoin address doesn't have your name in it. Yeah. So do, where do you think kind of in the stack, layer one, and layer zero, even at the networking layer, layer two, like where do you think you have to actually implement privacy as a, as a cryptocurrency? Right. Um, 
Yeah, so privacy isn't a feature you can add, like in a new layer or in one layer or whatever. Privacy is the absence of data leakage. And that means you have to do it at all the layers. Because like if, if one of the layers is leaking all of your data to your adversary and they're exploiting it and using it against you, that it doesn't matter if one of the other layers isn't. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's really hard. Um, but the blockchain layer is the, you know, the one that I'm paying the closest attention to right now. Um, and it's a really important one because if it leaks information, it leaks it to everyone, which means yeah. all the you know, foreign governments and your worst enemy and your stalker and everyone else. Yeah. And do you, think there's, uh, do you think there's such a thing as too good a privacy? Like, do you, get to a, do you worry that Zcash privacy might be so good that, that it makes governments uncomfortable, whereas something like Bitcoin is good enough privacy and so it can kind of, you know, people are okay with it, governments are okay with it? Or do you not subscribe to this idea that you can have your privacy can be too good? You mean too good for government's yeah. comfort level? Yeah. Well, because you know, it's one a question of question about whether that's the goal, government yeah. comfort level. What were you going to say? Well, it reminds me a little bit of. I mean, if you look at if you, you mentioned the internet, right? One of the really interesting things that happened on the internet was it, it sort of eventually got more and more private. Right. And you, you could argue that um, parts of the internet are extremely not private. You know, these would be cookies and, and tracking, and, and so setting that aside a little bit, kind of part of the internet went in one direction, but. Um, you know, end-to-end -end encryption of traffic, for example, everything was plain text in the early days, and it right. sort of evolved over time. And so, and the government was really uncomfortable with. They were very uncomfortable with. It. Yeah, they tried to regulate cryptography in the early days and yep. encryption in the early days. Um, but you know, some people argue that part of the reason that the internet ended up being able to have HTTPS and and you know end-to-end -end encryption was because it was good enough, and then you sort of you know over time got better and better. Um, and had you started out, you know, kind of where we are today. Um, on the internet that, that maybe the government just wouldn't have been okay with it. Well, there, that's the analogy to what's going on right now with Bitcoin and Ethereum and Zcash. Um, like the government of India is already uncomfortable with all of them. Yeah. And is already trying to ban all of them, right? Um, the government of USA is not trying to ban any of those three right now. Wait, what was the question? Is it? Oh, it, can you have too good of privacy? Like, do you, do you worry that actually by going out of the gate with such strong privacy that well, you actually... What we have done in Zcash is working pretty well, um, namely making like cryptographic strength privacy, which I analogize like you do to SSL yeah. in the 90s. Um, but in Zcash, we have that like backward compatible HTTP mode. And that was originally not intended to make governments more comfortable. It was originally intended to make implementers more comfortable mm. so they could reuse their Bitcoin no. implementations. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, that was, the, that was the intention of That's that. That's pretty funny. Uh, and it's worked very well for that. But it also works well for making governments more comfortable, even though I think that's a mistake on their part. But it works. Interesting. Um, so uh, how do you think about Zcash relative to other privacy coins? Like, do you, th do you think, how do you think this landscape sort of plays? Zcash is the best. <laughs> um, well, you're not biased, so. Um, but yeah, no, how, do you, how not, do you think this plays out over the next couple of years? Because people it's are not taking different I, approaches. It's not that I think it's the best because I'm committed to Zcash. It's that I went and decided to make Zcash because I had examined the others and thought they weren't good enough. Can you say more? Like, what, how do you think this plays out then? Do you think? Well, because. Like I said earlier, privacy, like I'd worked in privacy technology long before Bitcoin. Yeah. And the blockchain layer is really hard. Like I was saying, you have to have, you have to avoid leaking people's personal data at all the layers if you're going to successfully avoid leaking people's personal data, yeah. right? Uh, and we know how to do that more or less with HTTPS at the web layer and yeah. with uh, networking and so forth. Uh, but we didn't have a good way to avoid exposing people at the blockchain layer. And <clears throat> we were considering launching Zcash, we looked at Monero and all the other techniques that had been proposed for adding privacy at the blockchain layer. And we said, none of those are gonna work. None of those are good enough. Uh, but because of the invention of the new zero knowledge proof cryptography, we thought that would be good enough. So that's why we're doing this. So one of, the, one of the knocks that people have with the particular approach that you guys take is um, sort of the, the trade-off with usability. You know, proof generation can take a long time. So mm -hmm. how do you think about when you're, when you're designing protocol or when you're, when you're sort of encouraging the ecosystem around Zcash, how do you think about that, um, 
that sort of privacy versus usability trade-off? Um, there's a there's a there's efficiency, and then there's user interface. Um, so definitely, anything that's inefficient in computation or networking or anything is a usability problem. Um, and that's a challenge for newfangled cryptography to be, to be efficient enough. Um, and, but then user interface, I think that privacy and usability are, uh, help each other and are not contradictory because I think privacy is about consent. And I think good user experience is about the computer doing what you told it, like understanding what you meant and just doing that. Um, and so that means if you, if you say you want to expose information about yourself to someone, the computer does that for you, and it doesn't expose information about you to other people that you didn't say to do that, and so therefore I think it's good user experience and not worse. Does that make sense? I think, I, I think so. Um, I think security and u usability are really, I think it's a mistake that people often think of them as contradictory, and that's just bad security and UX design that makes them that way. Does that make sense? Yep. It, it does. Um, let's, you want to switch, maybe we can switch to kind of, um, that's a great high level overview, I think, just to get everybody up to speed on kind of how you think about the world. Um, I think one of the more interesting things that's sort of topical and timely that's happening right now is um, Zcash is going through a bit of an evolution uh, in thinking about the future of Zcash and, and the developer fund, exp, you know, uh, sort of process of how do you actually fund protocol development. Can you give a little update kind of on what's happening and kind of where, where things are? Just for people who may not have full context on, on what's been happening. How much background do people in here already know about Zcash's funding? Uh, Raise your hand if you know how Zcash is funded today. OK, keep your hand up if you have been following what's been, that's a lot of people, actually. That's great. Yeah, uh, that's a lot. Uh, keep your hand up if you uh, have been tracking um, some of the discussions around how Zcash will be funded going forward. OK, so it's kind of like half. Yeah, maybe so like for, the, for the half of the people who don't know how Zcash is funded in the first place, um, for the f when we launched the Zcash blockchain, the consensus rules were baked in at the launch that say for the first four years, 80, it's a proof of work blockchain, 80% of all the coins go to the proof of work miner who found that block, and 20% of the coins go to a bunch of founders. Um, and out of that 20%, some of them have gone to my company to fund continuing development. So that's, that's where we are so far. And you're now in year three of, of... Yeah, this is year three out of that four year era. Yeah, and so now um, you want to give a little overview of kind of, of how, what happens after next year? Or what happens when okay, year so, four? So next year, the, those, that first four year era ends. And the Zcash community is deciding what to do about that. And what's really the important takeaway result of this is that the Zcash community is taking power away from me. But I don't necessarily expect you to believe that because I'm the one saying it. <laughs> I'm up here. So watch this. Here. You, you scoot over there. OK. So, Vichal, you recently proposed that the Zcash community uh, allocate new coins from, from the blockchain starting next year. Just and so you know, I have more questions for you. What? I have more questions for you, too. So. Oh, you have more questions? <laughs> we'll see about that. I have questions for you. And let's see, didn't you propose that it's gonna, the, Z, the new consensus rules should be changed to give all those coins to a five-person council that you're going to set up? Um, sort of. Um, so just, just for context, I put a proposal out there because I was, I was tracking and I was uh, unhappy with the, the proposal that I saw, uh, the proposals that were being put out there. And the, the motivations were really, I thought, that the community needed to take power away from Zuko, uh, <laughs> in short. Uh, uh -huh. Really, like, you know, we need to move towards decentralization for this thing to survive. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, for, for full disclosure, like, you know, we, we don't hold any... Uh, Zcash, so I, you know, I'm not trying to pump, you know, I don't have like heavy bags or something. So Electric Capital doesn't hold any Zcash? No, and actually funny, uh, Electric Capital is not affiliated with Electric Coin Company. We were Electric Capital before there was an Electric Coin Company. Uh, Sorry about that. And uh, I'm not going to spend the next 10 years of my life telling people that I'm not affiliated with the Electric Coin Company. Um, but uh, no, it was, it was very much motivated from this place of if I put on my like 
you know, my startup CEO hat, how do I think about um, governance and how do I think about moving this ecosystem towards decentralization? And the things that jumped out at me were, um, you know, I think there have to be more people building. I think you mm. need ideally a really long tail of developers. I think Ethereum has done a great job of, of creating a community where thousands of people want to come in and write code. Mm -hmm. um, I think you want to create a, a process by which the people who are deciding where the money goes are not the recipients of the money. Mm. Um, and so in my proposal, I ex explicitly said that the people who are allocating capital can't be receiving the capital. So what that would mean is, for example, like, um, so that ECC. means I can't apply right. to be you, on the five you, you board of on it, directors. Right. As long as you're CEO of, of the electric coin company, you couldn't be on the on the uh, the group that decides where the money goes. So I have to choose. If the community settles on your proposal, then right. I have to choose between applying for a seat, right, and, or I and can apply it. for a seat. And if I get elected, then I'm forced to correct like seed CEO of Correct. my company. Yeah, and I think you want, like in any good governance system, I think you want some sort of like separation of powers and you want like checks and balances. And so I think one proposal was basically you, you take the, um, the people who are gonna give the money to people to go do work and make sure that they're not the recipients of that money. And so the people doing the work are different than the people um, uh, they're deciding where the money goes. Uh, kind, kind of relatedly, I think you want, like one of the things I think um, hasn't been, uh, you know, uh, great in, in the community is there aren't accountability feedback loops quite the same way that, that you see kind of like in a free and open market, which is, um, you know, the, the protocol rules sort of dictating that certain um, individuals or organizations are going to get money from the, from the <laughs> protocol directly, I think, is not great. But you really want to create a system where money flows out. If somebody does a great job, they get more money. And so if they the, don't do such a great job, they get less money. The accountability feedback loop is that the, uh, the funding ends after four years. It's a, got a four-year-long cycle yeah. for feedback. Yeah, that's right. And then, the, and then the hope is at the end of that next four-year cycle, it's it's ideally there are enough businesses that have been seeded through the protocol itself that that there is a self-sustaining ecosystem around it, and so people can actually keep keep running their businesses and keep investing in Zcash. Okay. So you've put forward this proposal that for years five through eight of Zcash, twenty percent of the coins go to this five-person council. No one is allowed to be both on the five-person council and receiving the coins to actually build stuff. Yep. Um, and is does that have does that proposal have a lot of support in the community? Uh, uh, short answer is we'll find out. Uh, but it's it's been interesting. I think um, the discussion around it has been pretty fascinating. I'm, I'm actually curious what your what your perspective on it is because people have pinged me uh, uh, like privately a bunch on Twitter or. Um, you know, I, I, we've actually um, I reached out to some of the other people who are uh, who have other com competing proposals because I think there's directional alignment probably on like 75% of it um, around one. My my read is, and I'm curious what you think, but my read is there is general directional alignment that we should have a dev fund yep. um, that some sort of um, uh, independent group of people, ideally people who come who who understand the protocol, who are technical, who um, but also in my opinion people who should have some sort of industry experience and have like built and shipped software and scaled software. I think so that that's kind of specific DNA is to your proposal. Um, and, and actually one or two others, I think. I think there's oh, really? a, yeah. Um, uh, if I remember correctly, I think like uh, Chris Chris Berniski's proposal, I think has some some sort of similar um, tinges. I think Matt Longo's proposal kind of has a similar one. Okay. Um, I shouldn't speak for them. I should go back and reread them. It's been a, it's been a couple weeks since I've really looked at all of them. But I think a lot of them have this sort of belief that. Um, Getting, getting people who have built and shipped software and built products at scale is, is that's good DNA to have in an ecosystem. Um, but you know, at, at a high level, it's really, I think, 75, if I had to guess, like 75% of the proposals that are sort of being reasonably considered sort of are directionally aligned that there should be a depth yeah. and, and there, that. there are like 15 different proposals that the community has put forward for what to do about the consensus rules and funding and governance starting in year five. Yeah. And I think almost all of the ones that I see getting discussed on the community forums are something like yours, yeah. namely that there's going to be new funding allocated out of the issuance for the next four years and that someone not Zuko is going to get to control yeah. what, what is done with it. Yeah. Which is good. I mean, I think that's, that's what you'd want. Can, I, can we switch back? I have more questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I'm I'm kind of in the seat of um, having put one of the proposals out there, and then kind of you know talking with people about it. I'm curious, from your perspective, what are some of the lessons learned in the process so far? Everything takes way longer than you think, yeah. even when you take that into account. 
Um, Cause we've been working or well, the community has been talking about this starting from like a year ago. And yet, um, and we had said at one point, well, we have to bake in, we have to settle, we have to agree and settle on what the new rules are gonna be by October of 2019 so that everyone has a full year to like get ready for the new consensus rules to kick in in October of 2020. Because <clears throat> October of, because our the third birthday of Zcash was like three days ago. Um, and now we're totally behind that schedule. There's no consensus yet. Well, there's kind of a convergence like we were yeah. saying. It seems like everyone agrees there should be some funding and it should be controlled by someone other than me. Uh, but then there's a whole lot of disagreement inside that between how much and who should control it and how sh they should be elected and all this other stuff. And so we're really nowhere near um, like implementing it and committing to it and baking it in. So it, I, it'll, I wouldn't be surprised if it's like next summer before that's finalized. So that's my first lesson is you should plan, it, expect it to take a long time for a community to yeah. develop something like that. The question was, can you make it like a DAO? And That's a good idea too. I don't really know. You should submit a proposal. Yeah, you should submit a proposal. Uh, sorry, say that last sentence again. We've been through the rabbit hole, but. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I think. Yeah, I think I, uh, I think a lot of the proposals actually. It's, it's a good. Um, it's a good. Directionally, I think a lot of the proposals are basically saying there should be some sort of a DAO. And then, then, the, then the question is, well, how do you define DAO? How do you define who the members are? How do you define how the capital gets allocated? That's, you should submit a zip. Like, I, you know. Submit go, go a Zcash the, improvement yeah. proposal. Yeah, so you should, you should submit a zip. Um, so, okay, well, you know, taking this and other feedback that you've gotten into account and some of the proposals, do you, um, if you, could, if you could go back to the beginning of Zcash and do things differently, would you have the same governance? Would you change governance in any way? Would you, would you do anything differently given kind no, of- No, I, I think it's working great. Um, the whole idea, I mean, this is what we intended at the beginning, and so far I, I feel like it's working as intended, which is that we'd have a single like startup style organization, so we would have coherence and like rapid decision making and all that. Um, and that that would serve as like the booster stage of the rocket. Um, and that then we would have to have a community-wide coordination uh, puzzle in order to decide what to do next. So I feel pretty great about it because I'm pretty sure my prediction is that in a year, Zcash will be visibly more decentralized. Like it will be really obvious to the world that uh, sort of like taking out Zuko is not going to slow it down. Um, but it's also going to be self-funding, which I think is really rare in blockchains, like I think, and really important. Because if you don't, if, if it's not self-funding, then it's vulnerable to capture. Well, so what, hap what happens if the, the community can't align on what the path forward is and there's no dev fund and there's no... Yeah, if there gets to be like a schism or a deadlock. Yeah. Or something. I don't currently. I don't think it's on the path to that because, like we said, the majority of everyone who's currently speaking up is in the same ballpark as each other. Yeah. Uh, but there's no telling. If it gets into that kind of a deadlock, then I suppose what's going to happen is uh, it will revert to being a non-self-funding thing, like Bitcoin and Grin and Ethereum. So. Uh, I, I think uh, the question was, what do you mean on self-funding? I think what you mean is basically um, it's volunteers. Hopefully, they're ancillary businesses that have an incentive to support the protocol. So that might be things like exchanges because they're, they're going to make money. Um, and, um, and I think uh, volunteers, basically. People, probably people who will hold a bunch of ZEC will want to volunteer to make the, the you know. Right. So like, valuable. like Bitcoin and Grin and Ethereum. Yeah. yeah. So on the flip side, I mean, um, kind of related question, do you think there are protocols that are, um, that are doing a good job on the governance and the funding? Like, are there things you're inspired by or things you look at that say, wow, they, they sort of figured something out? I don't know. I can't tell because, and I assume that everyone else has the same problem with Zcash that I have with other blockchains, is I can't tell how much is governance theater, right? Like, these people, 
these other blockchains, I don't want to name their names because I don't want to cast aspersions on them, but they're these totally credible looking blockchains that seem to be run by credible people and they put out these blog posts and PDFs and whatever saying, look at how great we're doing at governance. And I, it, would take, it would take all day for me to like delve into that enough to understand what's really happening under the hood. Actually, this even applies to Ethereum, right? Like I'm really close with Ethereum because we work with them all the time on technical stuff. And they have a fairly transparent um, and like publicly visible governance process. But even there, I just can't keep up and I can't evaluate whether their claims about how governance works is how governance actually works, hmm. you know? Interesting. Um, so maybe to, since we're in the last couple of minutes here, um, to, to round it out, um, you know, we started talking about privacy and uh, privacy is consent, and so privacy obviously means much more than privacy coins. What are other areas of, of privacy tech, since you've worked in this space for so long, that um, you think people should be thinking about, and um, you know, what, are you, what are you excited about outside of privacy coins? Well, what I'm excited about is that society as a whole is waking up to the importance of it, and so now we have an opportunity to connect the new technology with demand. Um, because, because like, what indication do you have that people actually care more than they used to? Well, because like everyone's concern about Facebook and about Cambridge Analytica and um, just my general sense that Maybe this is my own echo chamber, but I just have this general sense that five years ago nobody cared and thought I was strange for bringing it up, uh, and now everyone cares. Do you disagree? No, I, I think directionally is right. It's really a question of like, is it 10 million people? Is it 100 million people? Is it a billion people? Because um, that's, I mean, uh, people who have cared about privacy have, have talked about these, these things for a long time, and yeah. it's, it's always felt like, people should care more than they care, and yeah. they just don't. The cypherpunks were early, but they're right. And one thing that I think is important is that like governments and businesses have come to realize that they care too, right? Like, um, part of what's going on with like the United States legislators waking up to both blockchain and to Facebook and everything else is at least nominally, a desire to return power to people or to smaller groups or to protect United States people from other countries. Yeah. All of that is privacy in different ways, at different layers. So what, what, what outside of uh, privacy coins in the last minute here are you, what are you excited about? You, All I'm really about? excited about right now is zero knowledge proofs because they're, there's no telling what we'll be able to use them for now that they're finally getting to be mature enough. Um, by the way, my employees just invented a new zero knowledge proof called Halo, and it's so exciting. It's the first ever trustless, uh, recursive, practical zero knowledge proof. Um, so it, like, if, it prove, if it works out, if it su sur survives scientific peer review and everything for a year or two, um, it might be the tool that can solve all sorts of problems in society outside of beyond blockchain. Yeah. Are there specific applications that you think are particularly interesting that you thought about? I, yeah, but I can't tell if they would actually work or if I'm hallucinating. <laughs> but just like the whole idea, like the way we do identity and the fact that everything about everyone is in more and more databases and the more things we want to do, then the more we expose those databases to more and more players, and then this gets exploited like every day. Every day. Like it's it's risen to like the level of a national security crisis that we can't control it. And the, to my mind, as a cryptographer, the fundamental problem is that the way you <laughs> it's just so stupid. Like you want to. You want to convince your doctor's office that you're the person who has the health insurance, right? Currently, the way you do that is you give them a whole bunch of even more sensitive data that they're going to like fax somewhere and it's going to get added to some database. Like the way to prove something is to ship more and more valuable and exploitable data as the way to prove something. That's just the wrong way to do it. Instead, you should just be able to prove 
which a zero knowledge proof is just prove the important fact, which is like, I have the health insurance um, and don't expose all the other stuff to more and more people. This seems like it could go really deep, but I also don't know if society can like learn how to use it or how many years or decades it takes for something like that to get integrated into society. What's a startup idea for somebody out there? We're out of time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.